It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. In the woods, nature has its own rules, and it has its own protectors. You're just a visitor there. You're welcome to explore and admire the life of the creatures in the wild. But if you overstep or disrespect their home, you can be sure that there will be consequences. Some believe that there are supernatural beings and gods that look out for man and nature. These beings are powerful and mighty, and always watching. Welcome to Freaky Folklore, the podcast where we discover the horrifying legends across the world and tell terrifying tales of monsters both ancient and modern. Today we are discussing the Thunderbird, a creature of legendary power and strength. This show is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network. Find more terrifying tales at EerieCast.com and be sure to follow us on Spotify or your favorite podcasting service. You can leave an honest review on iTunes, too. The more we get, the more we grow, and hopefully, the more monsters we can explore. If you'd like to submit an encounter or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to carmencarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N-C-A-R-R-I-O-N at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram for information on future episodes. The patchwork of clouds was casting long shadows over the lake and weaving in and out of the mountains that surrounded it. Aaron could see their pillowy white reflections in the water from where he was standing on the trail, making a mirror image of the sky. Aaron's grandpa had once told him that the land around the Sawtooth Mountains had once been inhabited by the Shawnee people, way back before Anglo settlers came in and pushed them out. It seemed like a magical place still today, and he could imagine that it was that way when they were there. It was a sacred place, and he could sense that. He stood there on the trail looking down at the deep blue waters of Lake Superior, and imagined that the villagers were still there. He could see children running and playing along the water's edge, while their mothers were making baskets and cooking or fishing, and their fathers were preparing for a hunt. He was so immersed in the image that he could even see a giant shadow move across the lake. At first he thought it was a cloud, but it was moving too fast. As he looked closer, He could see that it had wings, but there couldn't be any planes in his fantasy. They weren't even invented yet. Aaron jumped and snapped out of his daydream when someone smacked him on the back of the head. Hey, are we going to make this hike today or what? Bobby, his friend, chided as he stopped and stood beside him. Sorry, Aaron said with a smirk. This view always gets to me. It takes me back to a time when the world was more peaceful and simpler. Aaron had been telling Bobby about this area for years now. He told him stories from his and his grandpa's many fly fishing trips, and about canoeing the Salmon River with his friends when he was in school. Sharing his memories of this beautiful place with Bobby had caused him to become intrigued. Bobby had grown up in the outskirts of Los Angeles, in the suburbs. He had never experienced anything like this. His wilderness had been a concrete jungle. Bobby had become his friend when they began working together at the law firm in Newport Beach as interns. They had bonded through their struggles as fledgling lawyers over the last several years. After passing the bar exam and getting some hefty experience, Aaron had been offered a job at a law firm in his hometown of Duluth, Minnesota. He had always intended to return home someday. 
So this is a country boy's idea of a good time. Bobby teased as they were on their way down the trail towards the lake. Well, it beats racquetball and tennis in my book, Aaron replied. When they reached the shoreline at the edge of the lake, they dropped their backpacks and tested the waters. It still seemed rather cool for late spring, but they hadn't come here to swim. The plan was to rest before heading to the highest point, Eagle Mountain. The terrain was rather rocky in this area, so they found a spot just at the edge of the forest beneath some old pine trees to set up camp. Do you want to pitch the tents or fix something to eat? Aaron asked Bobby. Bobby thought for a minute before answering. Well, considering I've never pitched a tent, maybe I should cook. Okay, well I'll help you get the fire started. Aaron knew that Bobby had never cooked over a campfire either, so his choice may still have an interesting outcome, to say the least. An hour later, Aaron was surprised when he sat down next to the fire to eat the meal Bobby had prepared. He had cut up a bell pepper and onion and wrapped it in aluminum foil with some chopped smoked sausage. Wow, you never cease to amaze me, Aaron laughed truly impressed by his friend's accomplishment. I did my research. Besides, there's nothing a man can't do with a few YouTube videos. They were finishing up their meal as the sun began to set, and a large shadow swept across the shore. It was accompanied by the flapping of wings and a loud screech. Aaron looked up at the sky expecting to see an eagle or some other large bird. But this bird was so large, and so close, he couldn't see what it was. Holy crap! Bobby exclaimed. Are all the birds here big enough to carry off a Fiat? Nah, I think it just looked big because it was so close. It was probably a bald eagle. They nest along the shoreline. We may get to see one or two more tomorrow. Aaron explained but he was a little shocked himself. That bird had looked unusually large. It made him think of the old Shawnee legend he had once read about, the Thunderbird. A giant bird that was large enough to carry off a whale, according to legend. His grandpa had told him when he was just a kid that Thunderbirds could literally make thunder sounds with their wings and shoot lightning from their eyes. He suddenly realized that this would make a great scary story to tell Bobby right before bedding down for the night. So he told him the story of the Thunderbird, and how one had once attacked a small boy in his backyard and carried him over 30 feet. Thanks, man. Nightmare fuel is just what I needed. Bobby grumbled as he crawled into his tent. The next morning they woke and packed up their things made sure the fire was out and the area was clean before hitting the trail. It was a 15-mile hike from the lake to the summit of Eagle Mountain, and it was all uphill, so it was going to be a long day. They were about a mile into the forest when they saw their first bald eagle soaring high above them, but close enough to make out what it was. Isn't it beautiful? Aaron exclaimed as he looked up in awe. The sight of them never got old. For years they had been scarce, but more recently they had begun to repopulate in the forests, and especially around the lake. He had read that somewhere. He hadn't been here for years himself. Bobby grunted, not quite in agreement. Maybe, but in a pinch, I bet they taste as good as chicken. Aaron ignored him and watched the eagle until it disappeared from sight. They continued on again, getting closer to the base of the mountain where the hike began to get steeper. What is that? Bobby asked suddenly, pointing to a limb in one of the pine trees above them. It looks like a nest, but it's huge. That's exactly what it is, Bobby. You just found an eagle nest. I wonder if there are any babies in it, Aaron stated curiously. There's only one way to find out, 
Bobby replied as he picked up a good-sized rock off the ground and threw it at the nest. Hey, don't do that, Aaron blurted. If there are babies, you could hurt them. Okay, tree hugger, Bobby retorted and dropped the second rock that he had already picked up. I have to use the bathroom, Aaron told him as he began to walk off into the woods. Leave the nest alone, you jerk. You don't want to piss off a mama bird that size. But as soon as Aaron was out of sight, Bobby reached down, picked up the rock, and threw it at the nest, hitting it hard, leaving a hole in the side. He immediately heard a frenzied chirping coming from the nest. Just then, Aaron walked from around a tree, zipping his pants. The birds were so loud that he heard them instantly. What did you do, Bobby? He asked angrily. I didn't think I would actually hit it. I just wanted to stir them up. Bobby tried to explain, but Aaron was practically seething. You know the law. You're an expert on it. The fine for disturbing a bald eagle's nest is practically your whole year's salary. I know, I wasn't thinking that far ahead. I thought, well, I guess I just didn't think, Bobby said, truly ashamed. But look, the nest is still stable. They should be fine. The mama will probably come and patch it back up. They were still looking at the nest when they saw a small, bald head peek through the hole. It was one of the babies. It was chirping loudly, looking for its mother. It began to wriggle its little body through the hole until it lost its balance and fell to the ground, hitting several limbs on the way down. Aaron lunged for it and tried to catch it, but he wasn't fast enough. The baby landed on a large, rocky surface with a tiny thump. Aaron leaned down over it to see if it was breathing, but there were no signs of life. No chirping, no wiggling, no rise and fall of its tiny little chest. The baby was dead. Come on, man. We gotta get out of here before the mother comes back. A bird that big may claw our eyes out over her baby. Bobby begged as he pulled on Aaron's arm. What about the other babies? Aaron said. What if they fall out too? I'm sorry, I really am, but there's nothing we can do now. Please, let's just go. Bobby begged again. Aaron stood up and followed Bobby up the trail, looking back at the nest several times. He felt guilty for bringing Bobby to this sacred place. It clearly had been a mistake. They hiked in silence for a very long time before Bobby began to apologize again. I really am sorry. Aaron's anger had subsided to disgust, and he decided to finish the trip, trying to pretend like nothing had happened. After all, it was too late, and he'd probably never see Bobby again after this. They stopped at noon to eat a beef stick and an energy bar and then resumed their hike. Bobby had been less talkative since the baby bird incident and Aaron began to feel bad for him. You know, I bet you won't make it to the summit. It's pretty rugged terrain. And you are, after all, used to a softer kind of life. If you need to turn around, just let me know. That was enough to get a rise out of the ever-prideful Bobby. Do you want to put your money where your mouth is? He replied quickly. Sure, Aaron answered with a chuckle. What you thinking? Bobby thought for a minute before answering. One hundred bucks says I not only make it to the top, but I get there before you. Okay, you got it, Aaron said, relieved to have the mood restored and lightened. Before he could say anything else, Bobby had begun to jog on ahead of him, and Aaron gave him a good head start before following. He knew that he could beat him with little effort, but he intended to let him win. Aaron could hear Bobby up ahead of him, but he was a little worried he might get off the trail and get lost, so he tried to keep close behind him. 
but he stopped suddenly when he heard the loud flapping sound of wings. He listened. It sounded close. Shielding his eyes from the sun and looking up, he saw a large figure fly over him. It was an eagle. It may even be the baby's mother. It passed over him, and a few moments later, he heard Bobby scream several times. Aaron ran ahead as fast as he could, as Bobby's screams grew louder. As he came up over a large incline, he saw Bobby down on the ground crawling. His backpack was gone, and the back of his shirt was shredded. He could see blood soaking the fabric. It was possible that an eagle could do that much damage, but he wasn't sure. All he knew is that it was bad. He ran towards him, yelling his name. Bobby rose up onto his knees and turned. But as he did, the biggest bird Aaron had ever seen swooped down from the sky and grabbed Bobby beneath his arms and picked him up. Aaron watched helplessly as his friend was lifted into the air. Bobby didn't even kick or scream. He just dangled there, staring at Aaron as a bird the size of a Cadillac took him up into the sky and headed off towards the top of the mountain. Shocked and confused, Aaron stood there with his mouth open, not knowing what to do. This episode is sponsored by June's Journey. Attention all mystery lovers. Dive into the captivating world of June's Journey, the hidden object game that will awaken your inner detective. Join June Parker on her quest to uncover the shocking truth behind her sister's murder in the glamorous 1920s. I'm a couple of chapters in, and I love unlocking new pieces to the mystery after each hidden item search. The beautifully detailed scenes from New York's finest parlors to the charming sidewalks of Paris make the experience truly immersive. As you progress, you'll also get to build and customize your very own island estate complete with stunning gardens and luxurious buildings. Gather compelling evidence, decipher cleverly hidden clues, and unravel the dark secrets of the Parker family. Each twist and turn will keep you on the edge of your seat, eager to crack the case. Cooperate or compete against other players in the detective club, and you'll even get a chance to play in a detective league to test your skills. Are you ready to jump back in time, detectives? Download June's Journey for free today in iOS and Android. The legend of the Thunderbird goes way back in indigenous American cultures. Across the country, even in the Appalachian Mountains, they are still seen today from time to time. There are over 574 recognized tribes across the United States and Canada and they've all seen markings on rocks and caves that symbolize the Thunderbird. Described as a supernatural being, the enormous bird symbolized power and strength that protected humans from evil spirits. It was called the Thunderbird because the flapping of its powerful wings sounded like thunder, and lightning would shoot out of its eyes. The Thunderbirds brought rain and storms, which could be good or bad good when the rain was needed, or bad when the rain came with strong destructive winds, floods, and fires caused by lightning. The bird was so large that several legends say it picked up a whale in its talons. Indigenous Americans along the northwest coast of the United States tell many versions of a story about a thunderbird and a whale. Here is one version of the story adapted from the Ho tribe. The thunderbird lives in the sky, he makes thunderous sounds by flapping his wings. He makes lightning by rapidly flying through the air. The Thunderbird eats whale meat for food. One giant whale was killing other whales and depriving the tribe of food and oil. The Thunderbird saw this and went after the whale. He plunged into the ocean to capture the whale and a battle ensued. The whale fought very hard and the ocean receded and rose again. Many people were killed. Thunderbird and Well fought so hard, the trees were pulled from their roots. 
No trees grow in that place to this day. Several versions of this story tell of multiple battles between Thunderbird and Whale. Each time the water floods the land and later recedes. Each time trees are uprooted. In many stories, people or well pieces are turned into stone to form mountains. The Thunderbird in these myths is usually associated with storms and thunderous sounds. It's typically the most powerful spirit and found at the top of totem poles. The stories of the Thunderbird and well typically describe a shaking earth and tsunamis, with water inundating the land and uprooting trees. One of the most prominent sources for the Thunderbird comes from the peoples of the Northeast Americas, including Eastern Canada and the United States. These people are often known as the Algonquian people. In Algonquian mythology, the Thunderbird is ascribed the role of a god, controlling the upper world while the underworld is controlled by the underwater panther, or great horned serpent. The Thunderbird uses its thunder and lightning to fight the underworld creatures. In this version of the legend, the Thunderbird is depicted as a huge bird with wings held wide and horizontal with a head in profile position. However, it can also be presented as an X shape with the head facing forward. The Ojibwe tribe on the northern borders of the Great Lakes claimed the Thunderbirds were created by Nanabuju the trickster figure and culture hero of the indigenous American people. Their express purpose was to fight the underwater spirits of the underworld. Thunderbirds were said to punish those who broke moral rules. They lived in the four directions and migrated with the birds in the spring, traveling south after winter. These legends could have some truth to them. The field of geomythology which Dorothy Vitiliano created in 1968, looks to old stories as a source to understand earlier geologic occurrences. Ancient floods, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions are the source of many myths. The Cascadia earthquake of 1700 is said to be connected to the Thunderbird and well myths, as well as earthquakes and tsunamis that have occurred along the Cascadia subduction zone off the coast of the northwest U.S. Even if the stories that are passed down orally over time change with time, a study of patterns in a number of stories from a certain area can provide details about important geologic events that happened in the past. As a figure in the sky moves with astonishing speed toward them, the clouds turn dark. This massive winged creature's colorful feathers stand out sharply against the sky, Although it appears to be coasting on the winds above, thunder can be heard with each flap of its wings. The people below are in awe of this powerful enforcer and guardian. Look at the powerful Thunderbird. Although the Thunderbird is frequently depicted as a guardian in the many Thunderbird tales, there are occasions when this monster is compelled to chastise those with weak morals. The existence of the Thunderbird legends is a topic of great curiosity. Many people contend that these myths are only symbolic explanations for actual weather phenomena. Some people nevertheless have higher expectations. The Thunderbird may have been a pterodactyl that outlived expectations, or another type of megafauna, according to a small group of pseudoscientists. Some people who hold this belief think that the Thunderbird might not be a mythical being at all, but rather a cryptid. Over the last hundred years or so, there have still been sightings along the I-80 frontier, Pine Creek Valley, dark skies, and elk country landscapes of the Pennsylvania wilds. When Elvira Coates was a young girl, the indigenous Americans who resided in Potter County told her stories about the Thunderbirds. Coates created the earliest written sightings of these creatures. Fred Murray of Westfield reported seeing a flock of Thunderbirds near Dent's Run in 1892. This flock of Thunderbirds were described as looking like large vultures with wingspans of 16 feet. 
Lewis Sheldon, a different witness, was a pioneer in Potter County. He reported seeing groups of five to six Thunderbirds at once. And in the middle of the 20th century, a Thunderbird that resembled a plane in size was spotted close to Jersey Shore in Lycoming County. Thunderbirds have been seen in Clinton County in more recent years. Two witnesses reported seeing a bird with a very long beak in the summer of 2010, close to the Cowdersport Pike, north of Lockhaven. There were no more sightings found after the investigation. A Thunderbird was spotted by two girls in June of 2012 when they were camping in Chapman Township. The smaller of the two girls ran into the cabin crying as the bird, which had an estimated 14-foot wingspan and no feathers on its head, soared low above the camp. Douglas Cranmer, a significant figure in the Northwest Coast art movement, both in its traditional form and in a modern contemporary form, was something of a connoisseur of the bizarre. He frequently talked about ghosts, UFOs, and monsters. In 1922, he claimed to have seen his first Thunderbird, followed by four more. To be fair, it's a rather distant place, but they tended to live in northern Clinton County and southern Porter County. There's a good chance that a sizable flock of Thunderbirds is lurking up there, he said. There was even rumored to be a picture of a Thunderbird at one point. According to the legend, several guys killed one, nailed it to a barn, and then posed in front of it for a black and white photograph. The image, which no longer exists, has come to be known as the lost Thunderbird picture. Cranmer may have been the conclusion. Researcher Ivan Sanderson claimed to have left the image with Cranmer in 1963. In 1967, Cranmer perished in a house fire and may have taken the photograph of the Thunderbird with him. This is also mentioned in a book where it stated that the photograph burned in a home. The birds sometimes do more than just strangely fly around. They also kidnap small animals like calves or dogs, but occasionally children as well. A toddler in Lawndale, Illinois, is the subject of the most notorious Thunderbird abduction, or attempted abduction, in contemporary history. Marlon Lowe, at age 10, was having a fun time in his backyard on July 25th of 1977, around 8 o'clock. Ruth, his mother, heard her son scream while she was tidying up the kitchen. The 56-pound boy was being attacked by two enormous birds with wingspans of 9 to 10 feet as she fled outside. One of the birds lifted the boy 35 feet off the ground. Both birds eventually gave up on their human prey and vanished. Cryptozoologists saw the episode as a Thunderbird attack, yet Illinois isn't celebrating its close call with a child abduction by enormous birds of prey. It means North Dakota has a chance to claim the Thunderbird as its state cryptid. By its extensive collection of both old and contemporary Native American art, North Dakota has a leg up in competing for the Thunderbird. The Riding Rock State Historic Monument is located in the northwest of the state. A modest pair of small granite boulders, each approximately four feet across, bearing petroglyphs of thunderbirds, estimated to be between 300 and more than 1,000 years old, are hidden behind a straightforward canopy and secured by a steel barrier. The thunderbird is being kept alive by a contemporary Native American art piece in Bismarck, the state capital which lies four hours to the southeast. A 20-foot tall, 10-foot diameter, storm gray statue with four life-sized Thunderbird heads is located in Kilboat Park on the Missouri River. These fearsome-looking monsters, which were created by seven students from the local United Tribes Technical College, scowl atop storm clouds with their claws raised, lightning in their eyes, and impressively curved beaks ready to take on any orca or enormous serpent. Placards all around them share cryptid accounts of the Lawndale incident and other indigenous American Thunderbird stories from various parts of the nation. Despite being best known from North America, 
there is evidence of similar figures in mythology from Africa, Asia, and Europe. The Thunderbird has been depicted in art, songs, and oral histories through North America, from the Pacific Northwest to American Southwest and Great Plains. It's simple to dismiss such descriptions as personifications of natural phenomena like thunderstorms. The Thunderbird must be large to produce thunderstorm-like sounds and sights, and it obviously has to be in the air. These tales, however, originate from vast, desolate wilderness areas, places that may still today support a sizable species undetected. Aaron at first thought about heading in the direction the bird had taken Bobby, but then common sense kicked in, and he dug his cell phone out of his pocket. Thank God he had a signal. He was dialing 911 when he realized just how crazy his story was going to sound. He waited before pressing the call button. He'd have to tell them that Bobby was drug off by a wild animal, but he wasn't sure what it was. It wasn't a lie. The operator answered and took his information and location. He told Aaron to remain where he was and they would follow his phone signal to locate him. But Aaron wasn't about to stand there and do nothing. They could follow his phone signal up the mountain. He was going to look for Bobby. He began walking again, but it soon turned into more of a climb as he began to scale the rugged mountainside. He had been climbing for about 30 minutes when his phone began to ring. He had to stop to answer it, because it was probably someone from emergency assistance. He slid the answer symbol across his phone and put it to his ear. Hello? He said. But there was no reply. He said hello two more times before looking at the phone. The screen said, Signal dropped. He tried to return the call, but there was still no signal. He was beginning to lose his footing and slip when he tried to shove the phone back into his pocket. He reached for a rock to steady himself, but when he did, he dropped the phone, and it bounced down the steep path he had just came up from. He didn't have time to go back for the phone, so he turned and continued to climb. Surely they could still find him without his phone. He hoped so anyway. The climb was much harder than Aaron remembered, or he had just gotten that much out of shape. He had to stop halfway to the top and rest. The muscles in his legs and back were on fire, and his hands and knees were covered in scrapes. He was sitting there catching his breath when he heard a loud clap of thunder, followed by another, and then another. He looked up. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, but he was sure he had heard it. Once he caught his breath, he continued on, even though he was beginning to be afraid that he wouldn't make it. He struggled with every step and began to slip more and more often. He began losing track of time, but at some point, he heard a helicopter, and he leaned back on a rock to search where the sound may be coming from. It was there in the distance. He saw it, and it was coming his way. When it got close enough, he waved his arms trying to get their attention. They finally saw him and flew in as close as they could. Dirt and rock were flying all around him, biting into his skin and filling his eyes and nose. It was no use, though. They had no safe place to land. Aaron sunk back onto the rock as they motioned something to him before they turned and flew away. He would have to continue on his own. They would be sending people up the mountain he knew for sure but they would be far behind him, and Bobby may not have that much time. He found himself filled with a renewed strength, knowing for sure now that help was on its way, and he pressed on moving faster than he had before. When he reached the summit, the sun had begun to lower into the sky. The summit was easier to hike and was wooded. He followed the trail until he found the marker at the top. 
Here he was mostly surrounded by trees, and he began to yell Bobby's name in every direction. The only answer was the rolling sound of thunder again. And again he looked around, but the sky was still clear, not a single cloud in sight. He circled the top of the summit yelling for Bobby, but there was no sign of him, until he passed around the side opposite of the trail for the second time, when he thought he heard moaning. He looked over the ledge where he thought the sound was coming from. It was steep, but he heard it again, clearer this time. It was Bobby, he was sure of it. The sun was setting as he assessed the climb and then began heading down. He'd have to climb down backwards and hope to find his footing as he went. He slowly lowered himself down, finding a rock here and an indention in the ground there, until he made it to a ledge that had several trees growing on it. It was a small area, maybe 20 feet in length and 3 feet wide, but it was solid and flat. He heard the moaning sound again and followed it. The sound was coming from behind the cluster of trees that were growing flush against the rocky side of the cliff. He began working his way behind the trees as they scratched at his bare hands, legs, and face. He didn't have to go far before he found a huge opening in the mountainside. It was a cave. He had no idea that this cave was here. He didn't think anyone did. He reached for his pocket to grab his phone and remembered that it was gone. Then he remembered the flashlight in his backpack that he had nearly forgotten was on his back. He could hear the sound of thunder, and this time he caught a flash of lightning in the distance, followed by a loud screech. Stepping into the dark opening, he tossed his backpack over his shoulder and onto the ground. The flashlight was right on top. He immediately turned it on. The bright beam of the new flashlight lit up the entire cave. It wasn't a deep cave. He could see the back wall. Then he aimed the light towards the ground. His breath caught in his throat for a moment as he tried to make sense of what he was seeing. The floor wasn't a floor at all. It looked like a giant nest. But it was bigger than any nest he had ever seen or heard of. It was big enough for more than six full-grown eagles. He heard moaning again and swung his flashlight around until it landed on the source of the sound. He saw Bobby, curled up in the fetal position, at the farthest side of the nest, at the back of the cave. He was covered in wounds. He could see rips and tears in his shirt and shorts. There were even small chunks of flesh missing from the openings in his clothing and all up and down his legs. Aaron tried to make his way over to him, but he wasn't watching where he was going, and he tripped over something and landed on his face. He was trying to get up when he heard strange sounds coming from all around him. It was squawking, high-pitched and demanding. The sounds filled the air all around him and echoed off the cave walls. Flipping over as fast as he could, he pointed the flashlight behind him. The beam landed on a hideous, featherless bird that looked a lot like the one that had fell from the tree earlier that day. But this one was almost as large as an eight-year-old child. Aaron felt a searing, sharp pain stab into his thigh and then another on his upper arm. Something had bit him, and he knew what it was without looking. There were giant baby birds all around him, closing in from every direction, and they were hungry. Thank you for listening to Freaky Folklore, the podcast about mankind's horrifying legends and myths. Don't forget to follow Freaky Folklore on Spotify and iTunes. If you can, Leave the show an honest review on iTunes to help us grow. Freaky Folklore is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network, 
the home for listeners who love to feel scared. Go to EerieCast.com to find other terrifying podcasts, such as Destination Terror and Redwood Bureau. If you'd like to submit an encounter or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to CarmenCarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N-C-A-R-R-I-O-N at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram for information on future episodes. Tune in next week as we discuss the Mokili Mabembe, a water-dwelling reptilian creature that is said to live in the Congo River Basin. Until next time, stay safe out there, because this world is a strange one. <laughs>